Founders face mentors and masters. I'm Captain Hawk, CEO of Founders Space, the leading global startup accelerator. I'm also author of the award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Horses. Today we have Chuck Garcia. He is a fascinating guy, and you will soon find out why. Chuck, welcome to the show. Steve, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. I want to hear about this emotional intelligence. So there's been a lot of talk about your EQ, your emotional IQ. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that? Is there an EQ? Can people develop it? How does it work? It was very much rooted in cramming, examining, and regurgitating. And that kind of conventional education, while it had its certain value, it caused us to come to the world based on our need for a career ascension rooted in technical skills. I was finding that people were getting promoted on the strength of their technical competence, but they were promoted into positions whose job descriptions didn't match where they came from. You're being promoted for what you did exceedingly well. Now, the job description is you're going to lead, you're going to communicate, you're going to present, you're going to recruit. You're doing all these things now because the expectation is you've ticked the technical box. You must be pretty good at what you do. So what the heck? Let's give you something else to do, given your ambitions to assume leadership positions, where the job description that they so much wanted because there was money and power and prestige they're not very good at it. Many people, when they are in a very uncomfortable space, this is where you begin to find out who they are because you begin to see behaviors that may be a surprise to you, but have been buried deep inside and now revealing themselves because someone isn't sure this is how I should behave. And I really don't know what I'm doing. I'm just faking it. That is emotional intelligence, the ability to control those emotions, even though you may be under enormous stress and expectations. But IQ and EQ, if you put the two of them together, this is who we are, the mind and the heart. For hundreds of years, the conventional education was all about the mind. Redefining what it means to be smart, we finally gotten smart where we recognize the power of the heart and the power of our intuition. And if you put together mind, heart, and intuition, all of that is the layer of optimizing our EQ and our IQ. I worked with a lot of engineers. Yeah. And there are engineers who were just incredible at what they did. They were like amazing engineers. Yeah. But they want to move up. They want to get more pay. They want to get more responsibility. And they don't want somebody else promoted above them who is maybe a junior person or join the company later. So you're in a quandary as a manager. Like, do you promote this engineer? Because you don't want to lose this engineer. But then when you promote the engineer to a position that they aren't necessarily competent in because they were highly trained and technical and that's their natural personality. And now they have to become a manager, a people person, and they just aren't this people person. What do you do? What are some of the insights our listeners can take away if they want to improve their EQ, if they want to basically retrain themselves for this new role? I encourage everybody first to redefine what it means to be smart. If you have a great GPA and you're very good at memorization and you can regurgitate and you've got facts and figures to the cows come home, that's all well and good for your academic setting. But when you get out into the real world, the expectations are completely different because your ability to succeed in the real world, your technical skills, I'm going to give, say, it's 50 percent, not 60, 50. I'm not minimizing its importance. What I am encouraging everyone to do is to think about this. If any of our listeners goes into LinkedIn and they go into this report, that LinkedIn says, here are the top five soft skills that thousands of employers are demanding. Everyone key in on this list because it may surprise you. The number one soft skill that employers are demanding based on all of the job descriptions that go into LinkedIn is creativity. 
Think about that. The first aspect of a soft skill, creativity. To an engineer, creativity is key. You're going to have creative ways to solve conventional problems. Number two, think about this. The second most important soft skill that LinkedIn employers are telling you, persuasion. Because as an engineer, if you want to build the rocket to Tesla that takes it to Mars, you got to persuade Elon Musk. You're not going to do it based on your brilliance. Number three, take heed to this one, collaboration. Because many of my engineering students by their own admission say, I'm not very good at working with people. And my point is, well, we're going to have to teach you how. It's not your fault. It's our fault. Number four, adaptability. And number five, Steve, emotional intelligence. So think about what the world is telling you. To everyone listening, this is what the world is communicating to you. And yet you're spending so much time in college or in your engineering profession trying to get everything right technically. That's good. I don't discourage, nor would I diminish the capacity to be really good at what you do. However, now add on the layer, add on the top five soft skills on LinkedIn. This isn't coming from me. This is what the marketplace is telling us. So my advice, Steve, if people buy into what the market is telling you, why do we ignore it? Get good at what you do. Don't strive for perfection. Strive for progress a little bit at a time, but don't forget to bring the soft skills with you. Focus on them as a matter of your personal and professional development. You will not only be a better communicator at work, you'll be a better communicator with your spouse, with your children, with your friends. It cuts across our entire lives. That's my advice. LinkedIn top five soft skills. I know a lot of salespeople out there, business development people, they do focus on yes, those do. communication skills. They put a lot of time into it because yep. they see it as core to their business. Correct. But a lot of other people, whether they're in finance or technology or any, you know, a doctor, for example, right. they don't put any time into right. developing their communication skills. And often it shows, you know, I've been <laughs> into a good point. <laughs> we've all been into doctors, I think once or twice who didn't really get emotional intelligence and didn't really understand that a big part of their job was not just diagnosing us, but actually communicating that diagnosis to us in a way that we could understand and respond to. So what are some things they can do? What are these insights that you could share with us uh, that we could actually take away and improve ourselves? I'm a mountaineer. And what I, what I learned about mountaineering is there's no shortcut to the top. It's the greatest metaphor that I could live my life by because in order to achieve the summit or whatever your goal is, take a step at a time, Resist the impulse to do too much and focus on one of them. Well, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is focus on your communication skills. And the way that you can improve them, easiest way to do it, think about the people that you look up to. Think about who is a compelling and powerful communicator. Now, in the world of Silicon Valley, Steve Jobs was a controversial figure. People loved him. People hated him. People respected him. People couldn't stand him. But one thing I will say to him. If you watch Steve Jobs' 2005 commencement address to Stanford, just watch it on YouTube and hit the, hit the pause button. Look at the way, at the words, at the manner by which Jobs engages. And if you like that, go to his introduction of the iPod or the iPhone. Look at the techniques, the simplicity of language, the way he pauses Try to take in and model those behaviors. I admire Steve Jobs. I've never met him. I've read all the books about him. I looked at his style, and that's someone that I wanted to emulate. So when I wrote my book, A Climb to the Top, it's a communications framework that has something called the Ten Commandments of Great Communicators. As I emerged in my career, and I spent many, many years at a company called Bloomberg when it was a teeny little company, and I traveled around the world stepping on stage because I was given a job to be the public spokesman, not because I was a great communicator, but because I sucked less than everyone in my company. I started to get on stage without knowing what I was doing. I didn't have the luxury of screwing it up, so I started to experiment with language. First thing I did, looked to the great communicators to start modeling how do they do it. 
and then having the courage to develop my own style. Find a book, begin to internalize the lessons of what you're reading about this art form. Then, if you don't want to step in front of your peers, turn on your Zoom and begin to give yourself a speech, record it, send it to a friend and ask for feedback. It's a series of steps for you finding your style and then leaning on someone, ask them for their feedback and then try it again. And if you're not very good at it, keep trying. Ultimately, we get better at things that we are committed to, but it has to be strategic and it has to be con- intentional. Don't wing it. Develop it like you would an engineer. Engineer your public speaking style and then use it not just on a stage when you're at dinner with your spouse, when you're in a conflict with your children. It's all the same. The techniques aren't any different. You are trying to move someone to your cause. Sometimes it's on a big stage. Sometimes it's one-on-one. Sometimes it's just in a meeting with 10 of your colleagues. Is the mission any different? No, you're not just informing. You're inspiring. You're persuading. You're provoking. Because in the end of that conversation, If you're getting the head nods and you provide a strong call to action, they're going to engage in your call to action if you've done all the right things to persuade, inspire, and provoke. And you also mentioned one thing that was really important, tell them why, why they should care. That's a good point, Steve, because what happens often when people present their agenda, they make it about them instead of making it about the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of their listeners. So when you think about trying to move someone to your cause, The less you talk about yourself, the better. Tell them why they should or help explain the benefit of why or the consequence of why not. You can do one or the other because the consequence in the Wall Street world is often driven by fear and greed. One of the ways is to get people uncomfortable and get them fearful. The other way, get them to want to be a part of it. And if they understand why they should be a part of it, because... You could get promoted, you could make more money, great good power, prestige, whatever that is. Help them to help you. And we end up helping each other. And that's a beautiful thing. And then all of that, Steve, leads to then the provocation. So if you inspire, just by your very manner by which you engage, you begin to persuading them and you're persuading them to give you more time or to give you more attention because you're always competing for time and attention. And that gets to the third part. And I think, Steve, you provoke change. That's what you've always done. It doesn't matter whatever you develop, whether it's surviving a startup, whether it's the five forces in your books, what you're really describing my take, you're provoking a change in the status quo. So everyone think about what you're doing. Many people, Steve, show up when it comes to communicating and their bar is, I just want to get out alive. I just want to not screw up. I want to be sure that I'm perfect, bad, low bar. When you get up to present, what do you want your audience to think? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? That's the way you should think about when you present. That is the most important component because that's where the results come. I learned it myself when I was pitching investors for my own company. And now that I teach entrepreneurs how to pitch investors, I tell them the same thing. I say, look at your PowerPoint. It doesn't even matter. The information you give them, they will forget 98% of it. What they're going to remember after your meeting is not all the facts you bombarded them with, not all the technical details about your product. What they're actually going to remember is an emotion they had. What the educational model does, it doesn't tell you that. The educational model is get a 98 or a 99. And the guy with the highest GPA, the woman, whoever it is, that's the path to prosperity. Now think about what you just said and what you're teaching. You're provoking the status quo. Columbia heard from Amazon and Google and all the others, as I'm sure Stanford and Berkeley did. You're sending us great engineers. Then you hear the pause for dramatic effect. But, and it's everything that we're describing, and that's the reason, the why I teach engineers at Columbia is in response to the demand of Goldman Sachs and Amazon and Google, who said, we love your engineers, but we need more from them two years from now in their career ascension, because the more you climb to the top, the less of the thing you actually do that got you there. So I want you to tell me now about a climb to the top. I know 
it has personal meaning for you because you are a mountain climber. On September 11th, 2001, I was scheduled to speak on the 107th floor of the Windows of the World in the World Trade Center at three o'clock at the afternoon. Now, I originally was slotted to speak in the morning. And a friend of mine called me two months in advance and he asked me, I've got a conflict. Would you mind taking the afternoon and I'll take the morning? That phone call is the reason I'm alive. Many of my colleagues at Bloomberg were already in the building. They unfortunately didn't make it out of the building and the building collapsed. I was on a dead list for four hours. I was unaccounted for. I had not gotten to the World Trade Center yet. And my wife was freaked out. My brothers were calling into Bloomberg. Oh my God, does anybody know where Chuck is? No, Chuck is unaccounted for. So there was a list and the list had four names in there. Three names of my colleagues that were in the building and me. I finally made it into the building and people, you know, bear hugs and high fives. Oh my God, you're alive. The hardest thing I did, Steve, that day when I got back to the building, I was asked to call the parents head. They were young guys, two 24-year-olds and a 22-year-old. I was asked to call their parents. And I said, oh, my God. And I'm the communicator. I'm the one that's got to communicate it. That was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, bar none. The hardest thing I ever did was make a phone call to a parent to communicate to them that we are certain your son was in the building. I am so sorry. They are there because... They were supporting my event. I thought about that day and I thought about my family and I thought about, oh my God, many people died that day. That was not my day to die. So what am I going to do about this? And I didn't know exactly how I was going to deal with this, but I immediately said to myself, I need to honor them. I need to honor. And I I went to 16 different funerals and memorial services throughout the course of the month. How do I honor my friends? It's like, I don't know how, but I grew up in a world. I was always been, I've been a distance runner my whole adult life and I've always been a runner. And I grew up in in a winter wonderland and I I learned to ski quite well. So I always enjoyed endurance events and I enjoyed winter. So I thought about, and I had read this book by John Krakauer and it was called Into Thin Air. And it was a book that recounted the events of the disaster on Mount Everest in 1996. And I'd read it just before that 9-11 event. And it really piqued my interest in mountaineering. It's like, huh, I'd love to do this. On that 9-11, I made the conscious decision. I'm gonna stop the excuses. I'm gonna tell myself all the reasons why I should stop making excuses. I'm gonna go climb a mountain. And when I do, I don't know why I'm going to do this, but something is drawing me to honor the spirit of all the people that I lost. By happenstance, Steve, on 9-11-02, exactly one year later, I stood on the summit of Mount Rainier in the Cascade Mountains. When you reach a summit, there is a book. And in the book, you write at the top of the summit and it's connected through to a pole and you log in your summit that, you know, the time and the date. And it was 9-11 at eight o'clock in the morning. We stood on the summit of Mount Rainier with my team. And I logged in the name of my friends, three of three of my Bloomberg colleagues. And I did that because I can't change the world and I can't bring them back, but there's one thing I can change. And that's myself. How can I change myself and honor the spirit of all of those in heaven? And my father too. My father died when I was 24. So how do I honor their spirit? I don't know, maybe this. Little did I know, Steve, it unleashed the beast in me. After I did Rainier, I said, oh my God, I climbed to the top. I had no idea I could do this. It was exhausting, but it was exhilarating. A year later, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. A year later, I climbed the Matterhorn. Then I climbed in the Andes and I climbed in Alaska and I kept climbing. And as I was climbing, Steve, and this is when it hit me, I was in a mountain in Alaska in 2011 called Mount Bona, this big, huge, you take these little planes and you land on a glacier and we spent 14 days ascending to the summit. Bam, it hit me. I was still in Wall Street and I was descending from here on in. I am going to go back to New York and I'm going to form my own company that I call Climb Leadership. I am no longer going to worry about me. I am going to dedicate myself and go to work every day in the service of someone else's success. And I'm going to do it using the metaphor of mountaineering, because as we were descending, it felt like my career. I was like, wow, this was really cool. We unified our efforts, get our heads together. We're all physically fit. We've got a goal. Our goal is not to get to the summit. Our goal is to get home alive in one piece, but let's do our best to get to the summit. 
as I thought about in the dissension, oh my God, this is what I did in my career. I set a goal. I took a step at a time. There's no shortcut to the top. There was no shortcut to the top of any mountain I've ever climbed. And then I couldn't do it alone. I wasn't on the top of that mountain because of anything that I did. I was there because of the kindness, the generosity, and the spirit of all the other climbers that we were inspiring each other to ascend together. We were birds of a feather. And I said, oh my God, this is a metaphor. So when I went back home, I formed my company. It's a professional services firm. I'm an executive coach. I coach many in financial institutions, and I'm honored to teach at Columbia. But I thought about all the framework of how I learned to communicate at Bloomberg, and I'm going to put it in a book. When we climb a mountain, we have a backpack, and we have tools, and we have our brains, we have our heart, we have our feet and our intuition. The toolkit to climb to the top in, in the book is 10 commandments of great communicators. Every chapter is a different speaking technique. That's the tools. So example, Chapter one, the first tool, and to me, this is like the ice axe that I climb when I'm climbing a mountain, is called the primacy recency effect. It's the observation that people will remember the first thing you say. They will remember the last thing you say, primacy recency. They won't remember much in between, which leads us to chapter two, the power of emotional appeal. They won't remember what you said. They will remember how you made them feel. So we've now engaged emotion. Chapter three, speaking with conviction. In this case, it's the elimination of filler words and verbal crutches. Just like a mountaineer, you have to get rid of the bad habits in order to stay efficient on your trail. You don't want to expend any energy that doesn't serve the advance up the mountain. I worked on two succession plans where we were appointing the next CEO. And it was interesting, two different companies in two different countries, the criteria for their next CEO was the same. And what they said, it wasn't about where they went to school. They didn't measure IQ. But the criteria for the next CEO, number one, grace under fire. That's staying calm. Number two, resolves conflicts effectively. And number three, empathetic leadership style. Look at all of these factors. Nobody told me when I was a finance major at Syracuse University, that's how I was going to get to the top. They told me, keep cramming, keep examining, keep regurgitating, you'll be fine. So a climb to the top take control of the communication skills that go in your new backpack to make communicating and emotional intelligence a lifelong development plan. Everybody can benefit from that. And even if you're good at it, like I know you are probably still working on your own toolkit. I know I am always looking for new tools to put in my backpack to go even higher. Now, I want to talk about an experience you had. There was a time when you were climbing, when you had a near death experience and that profoundly influenced you. One of the mountains that I climbed, if you look at the world in each continent, the highest peak in each continent is called a seven summit. For instance, in the United States, the tallest peak is Mount McKinley or Denali in Alaska. That's the North America's highest peak. That's one of the seven summits. I've been fortunate enough to stand on the top of two of the seven summits. Mount Kilimanjaro is Africa's highest mountain. I stood on that summit. And then Europe's highest mountain is actually in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. It's geographically considered Europe, and it's called Mount Elbrus. On the 10th day of ascension, we got to the summit at Mount Elbrus, and I was exhausted. It's 18,500 feet. And on the day of that ascension, there were three teams that were converging on the summit. There was a Norwegian team a Japanese team. And I was on a multi, I was on, I had a bunch of Australians, Brits, and Americans on my team. And I had to really up my game. I took every ounce of energy that I had, that I expended. We got up to the summit. I was so tired on that summit. I didn't even have the strength to take out my camera to take a summit photo. So I was feeling really beat up, but Hey, we got it. Big hugs, high fives. We started descending the mountain. At around 17,500 feet on our descension, and I had crampons on my, 
on my boots. We had unroped the team. We didn't feel that there was a threat of danger. So normally when we're climbing, we're all connected to each other. We had unclipped. So each of the mountaineers then on the descension, we were descending individually. At one particular point, I was on a ridge and my right crampon stepped on an exposed piece of granite, just that little exposure, and I didn't see it until my right crampon started to slip on that granite, and I spilled right down the side of the mountain. So since I was on my own and I wasn't roped to the team, that piece of granite that I slipped on caused me to tip off balance, and I start sliding down the mountain. It's about 10,000 feet below me. In my head, and all I thought about was Mike Bloomberg, Chuck, do what you were trained to do. Okay, I'm falling off the side of the mountain. No time for panic. Immediately, and it's funny, that came into my head. Do what you were trained to do. As mountaineers, we train for the inevitability of those falls. And we go into a technique called self-arrest. And what happens is when you begin to fall, your muscle memory kicks in. So as I was now descending on that mountain very quickly, down I go. I took my right hand where I'm right-handed with my ice axe. I immediately jabbed it. So I got myself vertical on the mountain. So now I'm falling, but I managed to as quickly as I could. Instead of going face down, I immediately, very quickly, my instincts kicked in and I switched around. So now my feet are going down. That allowed me, as I'm facing the mountain, take my ice axe, plant it. I smashed it into the side of the mountain. I had crampons on my feet. We're told two points, three points, actually. First point, ice axe into the ice. Second point, right crampon, bam. Third point, left crampon, bam. I am now clinging to the mountain. I don't know how far down I was, but the good news is I was within earshot of my team. But here is the best part, Stephen. It's something I will never forget. Here I am clinging onto the mountain, and it was a beautiful sunny day. So, it, so there was visibility into me, and they could still see me. They yelled down at me, Chuck, are you okay? And I yelled back, I'm fine. Get me out of here. And I'm clinging on like, like, like the roadrunner in a cartoon, like clinging onto the mountain, and like I'm scared to death. At that point, my, my guide, his name is Mark. I see him and I now have a vantage point where I see him being lowered. He is being lowered on a rope by the team and he's coming down to me and he sees me and now he's juxtaposed. He's side by side. He takes his carabiner and he clips me into him. So now I'm tied to him. He's tied to our mates who are anchoring him on the rope from the top. So now I'm in a good place. I no longer have to cling to the side of the mountain. I'm clipped to Mark. Oh my God, I'm safe. And I was ready to hustle up, up to the top of the mountain. And Mark said, Chuck, stop right there. Take a look around. Look up at that sun. Think about your family. Think about the love in your life. Think about how fortunate you are. There's no rush here. Let's just take our time. He diffused the bomb, Steve. He brought a incredible level of emotional intelligence when I needed it the most. It calmed me down. He assured me we're safe. This is the opportunity to just take a big bear hug to the world. Look how lucky we are to be here. We summited Mount Elbrus. He looked at me, big smile, all chilled. And I said, oh my God, I just fell off a side of the mountain and he's talking about love. This is awesome. This guy should teach emotional intelligence, not me. But I learned in that moment from the master. The student was ready. The master appeared. My God, that was the most emotionally intelligent moment I have ever been on the receiving end of. And it has inspired me when I go into my classes, I think about Mark every day and how grateful I was for the EQ that he brought at that moment. And then what did we do when we were ready? And Mark started to ascend. I started to ascend. We were just in tune one after the other. I'm going up and it got back up to the ridge. My team was waiting for me. High fives, Chuck, you good, you good. I dusted myself off. We clipped in. Day later, we're at the bottom of the mountain. These moments recognize your climb to the top is going to be based on how generous you are to all of those other mates, because they in turn will give that generosity back to you. That is my key takeaway here. An amazing story. 
And it also makes some very good points. So I wanna highlight a few things you said. And one of them was around emotional intelligence. Your guide, what he did was he didn't just calm you down, but he made an emotional connection, a shared experience between you and him. And that experience brought you two together. And so that when you ascended the mountain, you could do it in perfect synchronous form. He gave me the confidence to be able to synchronize to him. I will never forget that moment. It's not only how he made me feel, just giving me the conviction that you're not alone, that I'm here with you and that we're, we're, we're equals here. This isn't about he's the guy and we're, we're all in this together. So I hope for those of you who have an opportunity in your career to assist somebody, this is your moment. This is helping them recognize, look into each other's eyes. The mirror neurons that fire between two human beings are more powerful than I ever expected. And they are on display, but you don't need to wait to fall off of a mountain to realize that. And this ties into research that I've read about where the teams that perform the best are the ones who have the greatest degree of trust in each other. And Google did that research on 180 teams. And what they came to conclude is exactly what you said. It's not about the smartest, not about all well, the best pedigrees. It's those that collaborate most effectively become the most effective teams. And interestingly enough, people's self-esteem are generally, their level of self-esteem is often generated by the harmony they feel when they are driving away from the office and they think about what did we get accomplished today? Wow, what a team, how privileged I am to be on it. That is what makes people perform at exceptional levels. And the key to that is emotional intelligence. No question. How you bring teams together, how you connect with the people around you. So if you really want to perform well in your job, even if you're going to remain in a technical job, having this emotional intelligence can make an enormous difference. So before we wrap up, I want you to share some very valuable resources with our audience that they might not know about. There are three books. If you're looking for how to best develop your emotional intelligence, your soft skills, your communication skills, certainly my book is called A Climb to the Top, but I recommend any book, public speaking books, I would make that the cornerstone of your soft skill development on the communication skills. I also recommend, second, for everyone, no matter what you do for a living, the classic Andrew Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is the best book on human psychology I have ever read, and I've read zillions of them. It's, it's 100 years old, and it's as fresh as it was. Second thing, or the third thing I'd say, is a book called Executive Presence, and the subtitle is called The Missing Link Between Merit and Success. Those, to me, are the cornerstones and the foundations by which I teach the soft skills, and I'd recommend that. You can also go to my website. You can go to chuckgarcia.com. My latest initiative is an online learning platform called the Emotional Intelligence Lab. It's a hybrid. It's an online learning course, but it's also a weekly Zoom call with me for, for active and experiential learning. So you can not only read this and take it at your own pace, you have the opportunity to interact live and to build a community among other like-minded people. And then, of course, the classic book, Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, and I'll recommend one more. And it's a book called EQ 2.0. At the back of the book, it gives you a code to go into their website and to take an emotional intelligence assessment. There are four measures by which you will get your EQ measured. I would recommend you take it get your assessment, find out in self-awareness, social awareness, relationship management, and self-management, you will see where you are on the scale. It's your areas of improvement in each of the four components of EQ. This is where I recommend you start your EQ journey. Measure it, manage it, develop it. That's great advice. So Chuck, it has been wonderful having you on the show. I encourage everybody to go out there and get a climb to the top. It's on Amazon. You can go get it. And the Emotional Intelligence Lab, that's another great resource. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can help us create more great content 
by subscribing and sharing. Also, if you want to access our online startup program, our investor network, and our entrepreneur resources, just come to founderspace.com.